All right, why don't we go on to the, the next slide actually, because while people are, while people are waiting, we can have them uh, start filling out the, the questionnaire. Oh, great, so, yeah, good idea. There we go. All right, so hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna wait a minute or two for um, other folks to show up. But in the meantime, two important things. Number one, we have a workshops channel on the Linkerd Slack. Um, and there's going to be a follow along component to this. So please, if you want to follow along and you want to experiment with policies or with upgrades or, or anything else, join that room so that we can help you. There'll be a bunch of other buoyant people there. Um, and then Catherine's po posted into the chat a link to the survey, just has a few questions uh, that would really be helpful for us. So while we're waiting, please fill out that quick survey, just click the, the link right in the chat. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, we're going to try and make this interactive. It's supposed to be a hands-on workshop. It's not supposed to be a webinar where we just talk at you. So both Charles and myself will be doing, you know, lots of slides and demos and things, but we'll be paying attention to the chat. We'll be paying attention to, um, I guess there's an official Q&A section too, which you're welcome to use. Uh, and we'll try and answer these things as they come up. Um, there's not gonna be an official Q&A section at the end. Instead, if you have questions, you know, type them out and we'll try and answer them in line. And if there's something we don't get to, you know, we'll try and circle back to it, um, or, or uh, maybe someone can address it in the in the Slack channel if the chat gets too busy. We're basically going to play it by ear. Yeah. And uh, if you do want to follow along, um, I already have a Linkerd cluster with 2.10.2 running. Um, I really think the fun part of this is going to be the policy part that William's going to cover. And so as long as by the time he starts, you have your 2.11 cluster up and running, You'll be able to follow along and um, with with your your own cluster and applying your own configuration, your own policy, so that you can see how it works locally. Um, yeah, that's my only note for that. All right, I think we should go ahead and get started then. Okay, great. Okay, so the agenda today is very straightforward. Uh, we are upgrade. We're going to do an upgrade to two point eleven. I'm pretty excited because this is the first workshop that we've done uh, following an upgrade. And it seems kind of like something that we should, or sorry, following a stable release. And then uh, I, I wish that I had thought of it sooner because this is gonna be uh, a fun thing to do. And that also implies that I thought of it, which I didn't. All that credit goes to our marketing team. So we'll look at upgrading to 2.11. Uh, we'll take a quick look at gRPC retries. Um, which is really an extension of being able to retry uh, requests with post bodies. And then William's going to take a deep dive into policy. So again, please ask your questions in the workshops channel or in the Slack, uh, or sorry, the Zoom chat. And uh, we've got folks standing, operators are standing by to answer your questions. So let's get started with who we are. We're buoyant. Um, I feel like this is, uh, William, do you want to do this one? I, I'm happy to do it. I, I think the honor is yours to introduce Buoyant. Um, or, or I'll do it, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're Buoyant. We created the open source project Linkerd, starting with Linkerd 1 back in 2017, uh, which was donated to the CNCF. We continue to be maintainers and the main contributors to Linkerd, also providing commercial support, training, and much more. Uh, we have a hosted Linkerd management dashboard called Buoyant Cloud, which uh, is really how companies are running their mission critical applications uh, using Linkerd in production. So today, uh, I'm Charles Pretzer. I'm a field engineer at Buoyant. I work with a lot of customers, a lot of our community and users to get them to be successful with Linkerd. Uh, whenever there's a challenge or something that comes up, uh, a, a fun requirement that has to be met that isn't, uh, that's a little bit of an edge case or outside of the box, I get to work on that, which is really exciting. And then I'll let William introduce himself. Hey, I'm William Morgan, CEO of Buoyant. I'm also a Linkerd noob. 
So I play the role, you know, and you'll see this when it comes to policies, I play the role of someone who's still trying to understand how Linkerd works. Uh, and that's what gives me my special brand of homespun folksy wisdom. Folksy wisdom. Okay, so let the workshop begin. Whoa, I've got some friends here who are helping me out. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, she wasn't ready for the workshop to begin, I don't think. She's got to get her terminal all set up. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is go through and upgrade uh, Linkerd. This is uh, going to be a very straightforward upgrade, the actual process itself. There are some things that we want to point out as far as the upgrade goes, uh, because there are a few breaking changes here. So first and foremost, generally, when you upgrade Linkerd, you want to do it sequentially uh, by point release. So uh, it's pretty, the example here is if you're at 2.8, you'll go to 2.9.5, then 2.10.2, and then 2.11 if you're using, if you're going all the way up to 2.11 or anywhere in between there. Um, we've had some folks who have upgraded from 2.8 to 2.10 or 2.9 to, actually I haven't heard of anybody doing 2.9 to 2.11, but I know somebody will try. And while it's not impossible for this to happen, it's a little more complex. So the general rule to follow, do point upgrade sequentially um, and it will, your life will be a little bit easier. Um, 2.11 has some breaking changes. There are, when pods are in ingress mode, they only handle HTTP traffic. And the reason behind this is that it's a simpler design for the, in, for a pod in ingress mode. And um, if you want more detail on how that works, check out the using ingress documentation in the Linkerd docs. And the short version is there's, uh, you can inject the proxy in the normal way using linkerd.io inject enabled annotation, or you can use the ingress mode for only, for, and this is only for ingress controllers for Linkerd or the annotation then is linkerd.io uh, slash inject ingress. Um, prior to the 2.11 release, all traffic was supported. In 2.11, again, the simpler design ensures that um, there, when linkerd in ingress mode does protocol detection, uh, there were some misreported failures that showed up as uh, I forget what the actual, what they showed up as. Um, I had it in my head earlier today, but I've got a PR here, uh, number 995 in the proxy repository that has all the details, all the gory details, I should say about it. Uh, so that's one thing to be aware of if you're using the proxy in ingress mode. That being said, we recommend trying to use the proxy, if at all possible, when you're uh, for ingress traffic in the normal enabled mode. Um, and the ingress docs talk about the difference between the two and when you should use each. There are just a few cases these days, as I recall, where ingress mode is required. Yeah, we rewrote uh, those docs pretty substantially recently because we, we learned some things about how computers work. Um, so if right. this impacts you, first thing I would do is, you know, or if you're relying on the proxy right now in ingress mode to handle TCP traffic, I would go through the docs first and make sure that you actually need to be using ingress mode because like Charles says, it's, 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 uh, it's not often required and we're recommending it much less frequently than we were in the past. That's right. And then uh, for regular proxy traffic, we're no longer uh, forwarding traffic to ports that are bound only to localhost. So this one has a lot of uh, the PR for, the, for this as well described. Um, long story short, there's traffic uh, when it's possible for a container to make a call to itself. Prior to, and my understanding of this change is that prior to uh, the, the change, uh, when the proxy, when this container would call itself, it would actually go outside the pod due to the routing in the IP tables rules that are set up when proxy init initially runs the init container. Uh, this has all been simplified, cleaned up, and as a result of that, uh, these unnecessary calls that the logic that um, 
applies TLS and upgrades traffic uh, is no longer called if the traffic never leaves the pod. So when a, a shorter version of that is when the container, when a proxy, sorry, not when the proxy, when the application or the service container makes a call that is never going to leave the pod, the Linkerd proxy is no longer going to execute logic that uh, is going to encrypt the traffic or upgrade the traffic to H2 because it's not necessary. It's all happening on localhost. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, I, I don't know of any like gotchas that would happen as a result of this. Again, that PR is, has a lot of description in there and I think it'll help if you have questions about this. Um, and we can also answer your questions in the, the workshop and, ch and uh, chat channels. And finally, uh, if you're using multi-cluster, you'll have to relink the clusters using the Linkerd multi-cluster link command. Uh, the difference here is that the gateway configuration has changed into a much more structured way, a tree-like structure. Um, if we take a look at the PR here, and I made this link intentionally easy to find. So when we look at the values.yaml file, and this is probably extremely tiny on people's screens, I apologize for that. Uh, right, there we go. So this is one of them. It's, this happens in both the Linkerd multi-cluster link chart, which is, uh, there's a note on that chart, which is that it is meant to be used as a part of the Linkerd multi-cluster chart. So uh, that's kind of like an expert mode thing. Um, if you're using Linkerd multi-cluster, you don't have to explicitly call the Linkerd multi-cluster link chart unless you're doing something special. So with uh, this, these are the main changes here that we're talking about. The, you can see that we have had a bunch of very, or values, key value pairs where we had gateway, gateway name, gateway port, et cetera. All those have broken out into a more tree-like structure. In my mind, it's a more sane structure where we have gateway enabled, true, gateway name, uh, the name you specify. So uh, it's for this reason, for this change that the, um, if you're using multi-cluster, you need to relink those clusters so that these values are properly set in the config maps for, that are used by the, um, the gateway, the Linkerd gateway component. So I hope that all makes sense. That's a lot of talking about some, some breaking changes. I don't wanna scare you because it's actually, the upgrade process is really, really easy, especially when compared to upgrading to 2.10 from other versions or from 2.9 to 2.10, I should say. So um, with that, let's just jump right into what it looks like, I think, yeah. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is an upgrade demo. And um, if you blink, you might miss it, but uh, I will point out things as I go along. So what I've got here is a K3D cluster running on my server here. So if I do, uh, let's see, yo dash, or this is a, an alias for kube control get pods. So I'm getting all the pods in the cluster. You'll see that I have Linkerd viz and Linkerd installed as well as some apps. If I do helm ls a, uh, what we can see here is that I have the stable version 2.10.2 of both Linkerd and Linkerd viz. Linkerd viz being the extension that has uh, the dashboard, the tap functionality, Prometheus and Grafana for viewing the metrics that are collected by the core, uh, the core, or sorry, by the proxies. So nothing up my sleeve other than that I have installed Linkerd 2.10.2. Using a Helm upgrade command, I can do Helm upgrade Linkerd, uh, Linkerd 2, Linkerd, Linkerd 2. Let's see if I did this right. Um, and this is gonna go and get the latest version, which is 2.11. Um, no deployable. Oh, I know I'm in the wrong namespace. The namespace, I think it has an emoji photo. Okay, dash in emoji photo. Is it? I've totally forgotten the name of the release. Uh, sorry about this. I 
just did this on a different computer. Let's go and look at the Helm. And so this is a good chance to look at the Helm installation docs. I'm totally doing this on purpose because uh, I want you to show you want to show you how good our docs are for installing Linkerd. So the repository that I'm looking for is Linkerd slash Linkerd two. Thought that's what I had. Oh, I know what I did. The name, silly. The name is Linkerd two, not Linkerd. And with that, uh, we have. Uh, everything is running as I would expect it. I have the Linkerd 2.10 um, CLI installed as well as Linkerd the 2.11 CLI. And the reason that I did this is I wanted to show you that there's one incompatibility that we know about. Um, if you're using the Linkerd 2.10 CLI and you've got Linkerd 2.11 installed on the cluster, if you do Linkerd check, um, it's, this is going to spin forever where it says no pods for controller. The reason for this is because the, even though I know that the Linkerd installation is healthy, the controller was a component that was removed from the 2.11 uh, control point. So if I do Linkerd and just to show you what I was doing there, L2.10 version, shows me that the client that I was using is 2.10.2 and the server version is unavailable. The reason it says it's unavailable is because um, it can't find that controller component. If I do Linkerd version where Linkerd is actually my 2.11 CLI, I see that uh, everything is on the stable version. So uh, I hope that is clear to everyone. Um, just for fun, I'm going to do my Helm upgrade Linkerd viz, Linkerd, Linkerd viz, uh, it, oh, dash n, wrong namespace, it's in default. Okay, so that will be upgrading. I really should fix this. Kubernetes configuration files. Permissions are way too permissive. So if I look at the all the pods in the cluster, or probably more meaningful is to look at the pods in Linkerd viz, I can see that they're rolling as they restart as they've been upgraded. If I do the same thing in Linkerd, they'll already have been started and upgraded and running. And uh, now I can do Linkerd viz check. And let's, we'll let that one run. Let's do Linkerd check first, just so I can show you that I did my upgrade. Uh, the control plane is, uh, <laughs> this still isn't running. So one of the fun things about our extension system is that when you do Linkerd check, it is extension aware so that any other extensions that are running like Linkerd viz are also checked. Uh, so now if I go back and do Linkerd viz check, you can see everything is healthy. Um, and that's the upgrade. Uh, super simple. I know I went through it pretty quickly. If you have questions about that, um, put them in the Slack and uh, chat and I will answer them as William does his policy stuff. So the only other thing that uh, we were gonna talk about um, for me is the gRPC retries. I mentioned earlier that this is an extension of functionality in Linkerd 2.11, where we added support for retries for all post uh, requests that have a body of 64 kilobytes or less. For a very detailed explanation about this, check out the video from our uh, last community meeting where Eliza goes into uh, the detail of what it's like to, to write a, uh, a highly performant system to repeat requests without, um, well, by properly managing memory. Um, I had tried to set up a demo for this and unfortunately you get to hear me talk because uh, the demo wasn't quite ready to go. But long story short, if you're using gRPC or any HTTP requests that are sending post requests and they have bodies that are smaller than 64 kilobytes, uh, the and you have retries configured in Linkerd, and that's the one thing that I can show you. Um, let's go. This, I realize this is tiny, but um, I'll show you what my configuration looks like for retries. In fact, 
there's a better way to do this. We'll go to the docs, configuring retries. Um, the thing to not overlook is, about retries is that there's a retry budget. And this is a pretty great um, way for making sure that retry storms don't happen. A lot of the naive implementations for retries will just keep retrying or they'll retry three times after X number of seconds. Retry budgets take away all of that and make it so that you don't spam your own system. Um, the key part for adding retries is within a service profile to add this is retriable to true. So I'll share this information in the docs with you. I really wanna get more moving forward to uh, William's part because the policy stuff is deep and there's a lot to cover there. So. Um, I'll answer your questions in the various channels and hand it over to William. All right, thanks, Charles. There is uh, at least one question in the chat, which uh, is a great question and I don't know the answer to, so hopefully you do. Um, and then I'll also second your reference to the community meeting um, last month where Eliza talked about implementing retries. Uh, if you wanna get into some interesting proxy details, that was a really good talk that, that she gave. Great. All right, with that, I'm gonna take over slide land and let me just double check and uh, can everyone see these slides? Catherine or Charles or anyone out there, just give me a thumbs up. Yes, okay, thank you, great. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about policy. This is the big, um, this is a big headline for 2.11, and it's something we've been working towards for a long time in Linkerd land. Um, and policy is a pretty generic term, so I'm going to try and describe exactly what Linkerd does in 2.11. I'll talk a little bit about you know some of the ways we want to extend this in, in future versions, um, and then I'll give you a little hands-on example using our good old friend Emoji Boto. And that's where things will get really dicey. Okay, so Linkerd 2.11 introduces server side policy, authorization policy. So um, this gives you control over the types of communication that are allowed in your cluster. It's built on top of MTLS identity um, and it's gonna add two CRDs to Linkerd. So one's called server and one's called server authorization. And I'm gonna talk in gory detail about these. So I believe that brings us up to four CRDs. So I apologize for that. We try and keep those things as minimal as, as possible. Um, but it's a really nice system. It's really elegant. It's really uh, expressive. And um, we're going to dive into some of these uh, some of these details. So the policies that are available in 2.11 are server-side policies. So these are things that are going to be enforced by the inbound side of the proxies. So they're not going to give you control over outgoing connections from a pod. They're going to give you control over what type of traffic can come in to a pod. Now in the future, there's client side policies and I'm not gonna talk about those, but you can imagine you know, ways of controlling that. For 2.11, we're just focused on inbound traffic. Um, and so there's a couple implications there. One is that everything we're gonna talk about is from the, the server perspective, not from the client perspective. The other is that we can only control traffic going into a meshed pod. So traffic to non-meshed pods is not something that Linkerd 2.11 is gonna be able to help you control. Again, in the future with client-side policy, um, we get a little more, um, get a little more uh, power there. Um, so uh, there's gonna be two basic mechanisms and I'm gonna walk through both of, these, both of these and then we'll see them work in conjunction um, together. Sorry, just checking the chat uh, and there's two things, there's annotations and then there's gonna be CRDs, okay? And the annotations are gonna be the way that we set what's called a default policy. And the CRDs are basically gonna give us exceptions to those default policies. So let's take a look at that. So is this making sense so far? Is anyone in, uh, in panic mode out there in chat land? If, you're, if this is scary or weird, just say so. Okay, so far so good. 
All right, so let's talk about default policies. So every cluster as of 2.11 has a cluster-wide default inbound policy. Okay, and this is gonna be set at install time or at upgrade time using this uh, default allow policy flag. Now, we probably should have called that default inbound policy to be consistent, but hey, we are just humans. Um, and by default, you know, this is going to be the all unauthenticated policy. I'm gonna talk about each of the different types of default policies. Um, so by default, we are leaving the default, <laughs> by default, the default default policy is going to be everything is, is permitted. Um, and you can then override that policy either by setting it at the cluster level or by setting it at the level of an individual namespace or a workload. Um, and the way you do that is with this default inbound policy annotation. Okay. And then the one thing that is a little tricky about this is that when a pod starts up, when a pod starts up and its proxy starts up, that default policy is basically fixed at startup time. So if you want to change its default policy, you need to restart that pod. So updating that annotation is not going to change anything. And hopefully this, you know, is familiar to you from other kind of mechanisms that Linkerd uses. By and large, when we update config, we then have to uh, roll the um, roll the workloads. Now there's a little wrinkle to that statement, which we'll dive into in a couple more slides. And if you want to understand what the current default policy is, you can use uh, you can look at the environment variables um, that are set in that proxy container. Again, with a little asterisk there. Okay, so what are the default policies that are available? Well, we talked about all unauthenticated, which basically means all traffic is allowed. Okay, the next one is cluster unauthenticated, which means any type of traffic that comes from a IP address that's on the cluster is allowed. There's all authenticated, which means the only traffic that's allowed is traffic from Linkerd that has Linkerd's MTLS applied to it. And then there's cluster unauthenticated, which is combining you know, those two things or combining that with the previous one. So it has to be in cluster and it has to have Linkerd's MTLS. And then there's deny, right? Which is deny all traffic. And for every policy, except for that first one, maybe the second one, depending on your exact setup, um, you're gonna have to add exceptions because otherwise things are gonna break. So we have given you, I think, the biggest foot gun that Linkerd has ever given you, which is we've given you ways to make it so that traffic that you need to happen, uh, that you need to have happen is, is not happening. Okay, and I know these names are all very similar. Everything that I'm saying here is in the docs. So uh, you know, don't worry if you don't remember each and every one of these characters, you can always open the docs. Okay, uh, I think it'd be a quick note about cluster networks. So if you remember here, I'll go back to the previous slide. We have cluster unauthenticated, cluster authenticated, right? Kubernetes doesn't actually give us a great way of knowing the IP range of the cluster. So by default, we just say, okay, everything in those private IP blocks, you know, is all considered part of the cluster network. But if you really want, you know, uh, guarantees around this to make sense, you need to update that. And there's a variable that we give you where you can say, okay, my cluster network is on the 10.0. whatever space, or it's on the 127 or the 192.0. whatever space. So if you're relying on those cluster um, default policies, I would suggest telling us what the cluster networks actually are. I would love to get this automatically, uh, but we haven't found a great way to do it. All right, how does it feel to be denied? Ah, here, I'm the expert in this slide. Um, so the way that denials work is uh, protocol specific. So if we know that this is a gRPC connection, then we're gonna return a gRPC specific response that says permission denied. If we know this is a non-gRPC H2 or H1 connection, we're gonna return a 403 response. And otherwise, if Linkerd is treating this connection as TCP, uh, we're gonna just terminate the connection or we'll just refuse to establish a connection. Um, I said terminate because if you update your policies, you know, the CRDs especially, are read dynamically. So if you update eight, if you update those in the middle of an existing connection, Linkerd will terminate that connection. Um, if it's a TCP one that is no longer allowed, it'll start responding with 403s, you know, this HTTP and, and so on. All right. So far, so good. I see no questions in the Zoom chat yet. Hopefully that's a good time. Okay. 
So let's move on to the next slide. So we've talked about annotations and the default policies. Now let's talk about our two CRDs. So if you remember, there's a server CRD, and there's a server authorization, and these two work in conjunction. Okay, so let's start with the server. So the server basically takes a port and it takes a set of pods. Okay, and this is all namespace specific. So if you give it a specific port, either by name or by number, and then you give it a label selector to select over pods, a pod selector. Okay, so that creates this server object. So here in this example here, I have a, um, hopefully you can see my mouse moving around here. So here we have a server that corresponds to the gRPC port on the voting service of OG Voto, right? So we're saying port voting dash gRPC, whoops, didn't mean to click. That's the name of our port in the pod spec. And then there is a, um, you know, the spec itself, this pod selector is saying all labels that match or all pods that have the app label that matches voting dash SVC. Okay. And they're also giving it a little proxy, uh, a little protocol hint down here. Um, and that's a, um, uh, that's a, a way of giving the, that's optional, but it gives the proxy some extra information and allows us to avoid protocol detection. Okay, so one thing that hopefully is apparent from that description, if you're a Kubernetes expert, is that servers can match multiple workloads, right? So if you have a namespace that has 12 different workloads and seven different services and whatever, you can have one server that matches a port on every pod in that namespace, regardless of what workload it's in. And that is important because a lot of times what we're doing in any kind of restrictive default policies, we're opening things up for the admin port. Right, and we're going to see some examples of this. The admin port on the proxy is the thing that serves metrics. It's the thing that serves health checks. And if that doesn't, if uh, kube, uh, you know, if the, if, uh, the kube, uh, you know, probe thing doesn't have access to the health check, then your pods never start. So we're going to run into all sorts of fun hijinks around that. Um, so here's an example where I have a server. There's another server CRD. And it matches this Linkerd admin port, uh, and it's going to match every pod in this namespace. Okay. So, again, server is just matching a port across a set of pods. Okay. Now, servers deny all traffic. So, if you create a server and you don't do anything else, then all traffic to that port is going to be denied. Okay. And that's going to override whatever default policy you have. So, if you have allow all, or whatever it's called, all unauthenticated, and you create a server for the admin port, you don't do anything else, congrats, you have now denied all traffic to the admin port. It's probably not what you want. So if you want to allow traffic, you need to create a server authorization, and that references the server. Okay, so here's how these two things work together. So the server authorization selects over one or, or more servers, right? Often it'll just be one, but sometimes it's really nice to be able to talk about multiple servers. And it describes the type of traffic that are allowed to those servers. So building off that previous example, here is a server authorization that says, hey, for that admin server that we just created, unauthenticated traffic is allowed to it. Okay, so we've created the server that corresponds to that port, and then we've created a server authorization that allows unauthenticated traffic to that port. Okay, and we'll see some examples of this later on. Okay, and like I said, uh, or hinted at earlier, multiple, uh, a single server authorization can match multiple servers. So uh, we'll see another example of this when we get to the Emoji Voto demo, but traffic here in this example, traffic to any server with the Emoji Voto API label, so you can see this match labels part of the selector down here, is allowed if it comes from a if it's MTLS traffic from the web service account. Okay, so this is another thing we can do with, with server authorizations. We can say it's, you know, unauthenticated traffic is allowed, or we can say only authenticated traffic. We can say, oh, it has to come from a particular set of service accounts. We can have a wild card in here, and we can say anyone in this namespace, anyone with a MTLS identity in this namespace. So I'm not going to go through the full set of things that we can specify here, but again, they're in the docs, and you can read through there and, and get a sense for what's allowed. But what I do want to point out here is that this um, Emoji Voto API label here is something that we could set on the server. And then this server authorization would apply to every server that had that label. Okay, so 
This is a little abstract right now. Uh, at least the way I learn, I had to get my hands very dirty with these things. So don't worry if you're feeling a little befuddled. Everything I'm saying uh, will be in the docs. And also you can watch this recording over and over again. You can listen to it at night and fall asleep, you know. Um, so don't worry. There's a lot here. Okay, uh, there is a question here uh, It says um, from Shankar that says, I don't understand the concept of the port in the object. Is it some form of selector for the pop? So if we're going back to our server object, right, we have a port here. So that's not a selector, that is a specific port, right? So the way that all of this policy works, all the inbound policy in 2.11 works is on a per port basis. You're saying for this port, here are the types of traffic. Here's the way that traffic is allowed into that server. So if you have multiple ports that you need to, you know, have policies for, you're going to end up with multiple servers. And we'll see an example of that again with, with uh, in demo time with emoji photo. Okay, so we saw all this. Now there's a couple of gotchas, and then I'm going to do the demo. I promise. <laughs> so uh, you know we've talked a, a little bit about this, but if you are building any system that denies traffic by by default, sorry, I, I got a little typo in there. But if you're building a deny by default setup, you need to make sure that kubelet probes are authorized. So, you know, that example that I gave about the admin port where we had it uh, unauthenticated was important because liveness checks, readiness checks, health checks, all that stuff from the kubelet uh, are plain text traffic that don't go through Linkerd's MTLS because there's no proxy in front of there. Um, and that also applies not just for deny by default setups, but if you're doing any kind of authenticated by default setup, right? Those probes are plain text. Okay, another gotcha is that um, the default policies, oh, I actually talked about this already, are not read dynamically. Okay, so the default policy for a pod is fixed, up start, fixed at startup time based on the annotations that are present. And there's an edge case here that hopefully you'll never have to think about, but I do wanna call it out, which is that if there are no annotations there, then we use the default cluster-wide policy, right? We talked about that very early on. You have a cluster-wide policy. And you can technically dynamically update that default policy with Linkerd update, you know, uh, or maybe it's upgrade, whatever it is. So, or, or by changing that config. So there's a tiny asterisk there. Hopefully that's like, you know, you're not updating your cluster default policy more than, you know, once per cluster lifetime. Um, so that's a little wrinkle there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the, the CRDs, of course, or the, the CRs um, are read dynamically. So you should feel free to update those as you want. Okay, one last gotcha. Um, <laughs> and this, uh, you can ask Oliver why. I forget, he told me and I forget. Um, but all the ports that you reference in your servers have got to be declared in the pod spec. And if they're not, then the server is just going to ignore it. Um, and we may be able to fix the ergonomics around that in the future, but for now, make sure those ports are in the pod spec. Okay, so with all those gotchas out of the way, I'm going to now do my best to give you a little emoji photo demo. All right, so give me a second here. I'm going to share my entire screen. All right, let's see if I can get this whole desktop. All right, hopefully you can see um, this uh, terminal window and then some Linkerd tabs open back here. If not, please let me know. I still find Zoom very frightening. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's, let's take a look here. I have a little uh, Kubernetes cluster. Let me make sure this is nice and big here. Uh, so uh, I've got a very basic Docker for Mac cluster. So, you know, really bare bones stuff. I've got Linkerd installed. I've got the Buoyant Cloud agent. I'm going to show you some of the Buoyant Cloud UI too, because a lot of the policy stuff in there uh, it, it makes it nice and visible. Um, but a lot of this you can do, actually most of this you can do through pure CLI stuff too. Um, okay, so here we are. Uh, I don't have anything really running on this on this cluster, uh, just Linkerd. 
Um, and the uh, very first thing we're going to do is we're going to install emoji photo. All right, so uh, let's do emoji photo.yaml. Let's see. Okay, so I'm running, you know, uh, if you have been through the tutorial in the past, uh, you know, hopefully these commands are uh, not crazy for you. Um, okay, so we've got emoji photo running. I have not meshed it or anything, but let's just double check and make sure that this, you know, that this thing works. Um, so I'm going to do my little port forward here, and we'll have, um, you know, uh, localhost 8080. Let's see, I'm going to kill that tab. So I should be able to do localhost 8080, and I should be able to see emoji photo. Okay, great. So you know, this is our good old, good old fashioned. Uh, emoji voting application. All right, so first thing I want to do is let's mesh, let's mesh this thing, okay? So we're going to do, um, uh, let's see, somewhere in my history. All right, so I'm going to do a command here that says, get every deployment out of the emoji voto uh, namespace, run it through linkerd inject, which is going to add these special annotations, and then reapply it back to the cluster. Okay, and so slowly what's going to be happening is emoji voto is going to be, you know, spinning up, with uh, in, in fully meshed mode. And this is going to be with a default 2.11 cluster with the unauthenticated um, uh, traffic default policy set at the cluster level. Um, so yeah, running 2.11. Okay, I'm going to click around. You know, So far, we haven't done anything with policy, but I want, I'm going to take this really really slow we're going to do one time, one step at a time now at some point this should start breaking because the web pod uh, is going to be rolled and then my port forward is going to start failing okay there we go great so now this thing is really breaking and you can see i've got issues here so i'm going to redo that port forward uh, put in the background okay and now i should be able to okay okay so now we have a meshed meshed emoji photo you know, and if I take a little look at my buoyant cloud dashboard, I can actually actually be able to see this up here. Um, so I've got a bunch of workloads here in emoji photo and everything's meshed. Okay. So far, so good. Again, no policy involved. So now, now let's start doing some policy stuff. And this is where things are going to get a little interesting. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to annotate that namespace with the deny policy. Okay. So let's annotate the namespace. And what's going to happen? Does anyone want to guess? Want to type it in the chat? What's going to happen when I go to Emoji Voto and I click around? If you have a guess, type it in the chat. Let's see. Let's see how much attention you were paying to my slides. All right. Andy guesses a red X. OK, it's a good guess. Anyone else want to guess what's going to happen? Come on, we need one more guess. Everyone agrees with Randy? Okay, well, uh, oh, Michael guesses 402. Okay, yeah, that's a good guess, that's a good guess. Well, the answer is you're all wrong. You're all wrong. Alexander guesses goes offline when the health check fail, wrong. Shankar guesses denies all traffic outside of the namespace, wrong. Michael guesses 402, wrong. Randy, wrong. Everyone's wrong. Nothing changes, okay? Nothing changes. Why? Why does nothing change? Okay, because that annotation, I applied it at the namespace level, but the pods are still, you know, running and they started before the annotation was applied. So the pods are happily running. They don't know anything, okay? So we apply the annotation. Next step is we have to we have to restart these pods. Yeah, it's not a dynamic. That's right. So Michael is saying it's not dynamic. It's applied to pod start. Right, okay. So hopefully now, now you'll... You'll understand. And the reason the reason why I'm going through this is because this was also my first experience going through, you know, uh, trying to apply policy and like I couldn't get it to work and I had to realize, you know, all these things. Okay, so uh, let's let's restart those pods. Um, roll out restart uh, emoji voto deploy. Okay, great. So we're restarting those pods. They should pick up this new annotation, right? So now I'm going to ask you again. Let's guess what's going to happen. What's going to happen when I go to Emoji Voto? And I click around. Let's do some more guessing. 
Okay, Randy guesses red X again. Okay, it's consistent. Anybody else? Okay, Atha guesses 403. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? This is a little trickier. This one's a little trickier. This one really threw me for a loop. So the answer is emoji photo is still working. Still working fine. Why? Okay, why is that? Why is that? What's going on here? We, we rolled the pods, we applied the annotation. All right, and here's why. And this is this is really complicated. I'm going to go back to Boing Cloud. Here's my workloads. See that little spinner? That's like something ain't right. Okay, that rollout, it's still trying. Look at this. We've got two pods here, the old one and the new one. And the new one can't even get started. All right, what's going on here? Let's look at these events. Okay, there. So that's that's what's happening. We've restricted all traffic, including the all, you know the kublet probes, so the new pods can't start up. So the old ones are just sitting there happily running, right? Because they have the old default policy of allow all, and the new ones can't even start up to take their place. So, <laughs> right? What do we have to do here? What do we have to do? Okay, so. In order for this to actually happen, we have to get those CRDs in there. So we have to get the CRDs in there that allow the kublet probes to, uh, to, um, to do the readiness checks so that we can roll the pods so we can actually have policy. So like I said, this is the biggest foot gun that we've ever provided to you. And now I'm, sh I'm shooting off each of my toes one at a time while you all watch. Okay, so uh, what are we gonna do? So I'm going to do that same curl command. Um, we have another one here called dash policy. I'm going to look at this file in a second, but let's apply it for now. Okay, so this is going to create a bunch of, you can see it's creating some server CRs and some server authorization CRs. And what we, we should see here in a minute, although, you know, it depends how angry, oh, there we go, Kubernetes is, the rollout is successful. Okay, and if we go back to our little workload list, you know, everything's happy. Oh, that guy's still restarting. Um, so everything's happy here, except for voting service, which just needs a minute to come up. And at this point, if I go back to Emoji Photo, I don't know why that one workload is so slow. Hopefully it'll come up in a minute. Let's, let's see what's going on here. What are you? Eh, it might be in some weird back off state, in which case, there we go. Okay. Whew. Everything's everything's good. Okay. So now let me go back to Emoji Photo. Now this app should be working. Everything should be restricted. I'll probably have to redo my port forward though. Yeah. Okay. Great. So don't panic. Everything's fine. Just got to do my uh, port forward. Okay. So now, <laughs> now everything should be working. Okay. So I'm clicking around. Everything's fine. Whew, okay, so that was that was a little journey that everyone went on. Um, now there's there's one more thing we're going to try, which is going to be fun. We're going to have a little fun. But right now we have a fully policy policyified emoji photo. And let's take a look at this policy very briefly. Um, so let's go to let me actually put it into a file. I'm going to do that same curl command. Let's just put that into policy.yaml. Okay, edit that thing. Okay. You can see in here, this will look a little familiar to you, hopefully. You know, we have here a server. Okay. It's called emoji gRPC. Okay. It's matching the gRPC port here. Okay. And it's matching all the pods on that emoji service um, with that emoji service label. So this is a server that corresponds to the gRPC port on this emoji service. We've got another one here that corresponds to the gRPC port on the voting service, okay? And then we've got a server authorization here. And this is, uh, we're gonna select over both of those servers that says, hey, if you have a server that matches this set of labels, then you are allowed to get communication from anyone who has the web server, any authenticated connection from the web service, okay? So let me make that a little more clear. Actually, we'll go to the topology page here and let's just look at Emoji Voto. Um, okay, 
So, uh, and in fact, I think we can just hide that. We'll hide that buoyant cloud. Okay, so here's emoji voter. For those of you, maybe I should have started with this because this is, this is how you can orient yourself. We have the web service and it talks to emoji and it talks to voter. Okay, and these are both gRPC calls. Uh, and then I have a little bot here that's just hitting the web service. You know, that's generating traffic so that we get live metrics. Okay, and this voting service, by the way, has, a, has an intentional bug in it. We're not gonna go into that because it's not necessary for policy. Um, okay. So let's try, let's try something else. Let's try something interesting because we still have a few minutes left. Let's try and break one of these connections and let's see what happens. So here's what I'm going to do. And this also gets interesting, by the way. This also gets really interesting. So I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to go up in this policy file and let's go to that voting service there. Uh, where's voting? Oh, it's down here. I'm going to remove this label. Okay. So it's no longer going to match that server authorization. So when I apply this file, I've removed the authorization from web to voting. Whoops, tube, cattle. And so we've effectively denied that traffic. So let's take a look. These metrics are live here. So let's take a look at what happens. So right now, web's at 90%, voting's at about 84%. We should now be returning 403s. So let's take a look at these metrics. While, while we're waiting for those metrics to change, Actually, no, let's look at them. This is interesting, right? What's happening here? What's happening? What's happening to the success rate of the voting service? Why is this, is it going up or down? It's going up. Why is this success rate going up? I think Shankar has a guess here. He's saying draining. Okay, the success rate of voting has gone up to 100%. Why is that? Randy says health check. That's right. Exactly right, Randy. You finally got one right. No. Thank you for being so brave with your answers. Yeah, that's right. So we've removed all of the application traffic and all that's remaining on the voting service is your health check traffic. So that's at 100%. And in fact, I think we could see that um, with a little bit. Let me go into the metrics here. I don't want to do too much of a buoyant cloud demo here, but if we do, um, sorry, I'm going to start here. Don't ask me why. This will be a little, I'm just going to run through this, but we were looking at the voting. Is that the voting service we were looking at? Is that right? Was it the voting one I changed? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so we should see, I'm going to do show me all ports and show me all. So this is metrics by all ports and by all TLS. And we, we will see that that line at the bottom that was at 92%, that's port 8080. I don't know if you can see my tooltip. It's a little, hmm. should I zoom in? I don't know if you can see my tooltip, but that line at the bottom, the, the low success rate was port 8080 and 4191 at the top, those are the admin ports, right? And those are health checks and metric scrapes. So those are at 100%. Okay, and you can see that our success rate actually disappeared, right? Because we're not having those calls anymore. And our request rate, you can see a similar pattern, right? You can see that here where we affected that policy, the RPS, to that 8080 port dropped to zero and it's basically still at zero. Okay, so that's what's going on. And in fact, if we go to our app now, you know, we should see some nice errors here. Well, actually, we don't see any errors. We just see, we, <laughs> we just see, uh, oh yeah, I don't know, we do, we do. Okay, great. All right, great. Now, I found another bug with emoji, <laughs> which is that this thing says 404, but it's actually returning a 500 response. So. We're gonna fix a mochi photo to you know not say 404 here because it's actually a 500. Okay. All right. So hopefully uh, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna wrap up here. Hopefully uh, this all made sense to you. I'll do one last um, kind of interesting uh, kind of pointer here, and I don't have time to go into the details here. But if you really want to understand the policies, I'm gonna make this nice and big so we can uh, see if we avoid the wrapping. Um, if you really want to understand the policies that are happening in your cluster, Point Cloud is tracking each of those policies per TLS type and per traffic type and is showing you exactly what's happening in here. So we can see there's traffic from default.emoji, uh, from that's the, the bot going to web. And here's the, the server and the SaaS that allowed it to happen. 
And here's all the admin traffic. And some of it is encrypted and it's from, you know, the B Cloud agent scraping metrics and some of, it, some of it's unencrypted. So if you want to have like a really deep view into the actual policies that are happening, um, uh, this is one, one way to do it. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing here because we're almost at time. Um, and let me, I think we have a last thank you slide. Charles, do you want to put that last thank you slide up? I think yep, I can. I'm on it. Let me, oh, I'm, let me get to my share on the screen. And uh, I'm skip past all those slides. Yep. There, we go. there we go. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Thank you for these great questions. Um, Randy asked, um, do you recommend 2.10.0 to 2.11? I think that's probably okay. Charles, what do you think? Yeah, I think that should be okay. I haven't tried it myself. And as Oliver mentioned in the workshop Slack, it's not part of our regular test suite, but um, I, I think that should be okay. Okay, great. Great. All right. Um, so uh, if you like this workshop, uh, please tell us. If you don't, I added a line at the bottom, which I didn't tell Charles about. So that's what you do if you don't like the workshop. We're going to try doing more of these in the future. Uh, I want to do one that's a deeper dive into MTLS. We have that scheduled now, November 17th at 9 a.m. Uh, and Catherine put a link into the chat. So if you want to register right now for this deep dive into MTLS workshop, um, I'm, Charles and I will be doing that as well. And we're going to get into the gory details of like, what does authentication mean? And what does authorization mean on top of that? And what does, uh, you know, confidentiality versus integrity versus uh, authenticity mean? And how does MTLS work anyways? And what are the alternatives? All that good stuff will be in that workshop. We'll do a deeper dive into policy at some point. That one's not scheduled yet. Uh, and if there's anything else you'd like to see, please tell us. There's a survey link. <laughs> one last time, I'll point you to the survey. That's an, there's a box in there and it says, you know, anything else or what do you learn, want to learn today? Just type in there, um, you know, because I'd like to do more of these workshops. These are really fun to do uh, for us, believe it or not. And I learned a lot doing them. I don't know about the rest of you, but I learned a ton. Um, and finally, you know, on behalf of Charles and Catherine and myself, I wanted to thank you all for attending. This is a great turnout and a great set of questions. Really appreciate your time today. And uh, we're going to send out the recording, I think, over the next couple of days. It should be pretty quick. Charles, anything you want to add to that? No, just I can't wait to get some tweets. Um, but uh, yeah, this was really great. I, I do want to do more of these. And if you all have like things that you want us to do workshops on, let us know. Because that's like, we can come up with things all day long. But if you have something that you're really interested in, we want to do those things. So thanks again for everybody for coming. This is awesome. All right. Thanks, folks. Talk to you next time.